life was very hard. And many other times that if we didn't have food, then we'd go to scavenge in the, in the dumping site. I didn't have food the day before, neither the other day before. I only knew that I was hungry and I needed food. As a child, I grew up with a lot of hopelessness and I knew that death was the best thing for me. At the age of seven, I lost three family members. I lost my mom and I lost my stepdad. I lost my small brother, Patrick, because of the terrifying disease of HIV AIDS. In the middle of prostitution. Feeling so helpless. Poverty made me feel less valued. It made me feel not loved. It made me feel uh, less of a human. Because it's so hard when you have not eaten dinner and knowing you will not have lunch and you're not assured for dinner the following day, it's just feeling very helpless, like things are not gonna be better. I lost four of my siblings due to preventable diseases. Uh, three of them child, uh, died before the age of five. My sister, we were sleeping with her in the same bed and she, she had died. Things changed later when I joined the program. When I started attending the Compassion Project, I was learning about the Bible, but the most important thing for me was that I was receiving food. I got an opportunity to go to school uh, with a pair of school uniform, with a pair of shoes. My mother heard about a church that worked with children. They're taking care of me, tutors, a pastor, a compassion director. Words are very powerful. My life was changed because someone told me, I believe in you, I love you, and I know you will succeed in life. My sponsor was a college student from Michigan, and in the first letter, she just told me that she wanted to make room for me. My sponsor, he was eight years old when I was nine, so he was one year younger than me. One decision to make room for one more changed my life. Saved my life. Saved my life. Will you make room for a child that needs you? Will you make room for one more? It's up to you. My name is Rafael. My name is David. My life was changed by a 26 years old college student. Her name is Joan. Gail and Roger. Her name is Jamie. My sponsor made room for one more. And that one more. And that one more was me. Was me. Sponsor a child through compassion today. Release a child from poverty in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I love how that ended there. Release a child from poverty in Jesus' name. Make room for one more. Years ago, about 10 years ago, my family and I sponsored a boy named Sawadogo Umaru from Burkina Faso from age 12 to age 18. For $38 a month, you can release a child from poverty. That's what we love about compassion. Now, it's been our tradition that we pick a partner, serve the world partner, to pray for, tell their story to you, and give financially to, to bless them and their ministry outside of our walls. We do that at Christmas time and at Easter time. This year, we decided to take a different approach. Rather than just telling you a story about a ministry that's exciting and doing amazing things where you can pray for them and give financially to them, we want to take it a step further and ask you to make a, an ongoing commitment by sponsoring a compassion child. This week, Palm Sunday and Easter, we'll be telling different stories of compassion children. In fact, you're going to have a compassion um, alumnus come and, her name is Cecilia, come and tell you her story next weekend. Don't miss that. She'll be here uh, and you'll, you'll get to hear her tell her story about how it changed her life in person. 
But we're asking you to consider, to prayerfully consider sponsoring a child. So at every campus, throughout the next three weeks, there's gonna be compassion tables in the lobby, and there are kids to be sponsors. We are focusing on the country of Ecuador. We have a long-standing history with Ecuador, uh, a relationship with that country as a, as a church family for years. There are just over 500 students unsponsored in Ecuador. I believe that God will move in our hearts that across Chapel Street Church, we could wipe that off the slate, sponsor all the children left in Ecuador this Easter season. So there are no unsponsored kid, compassion kids in Ecuador. When you go back to the table, if you do, there's a, there'll be a bunch of these cards. It, and here's the temptation. You're gonna look for the cutest one, the youngest one, the, the one that you want. Whoever your eyes, if God's moving in your heart, whatever child your eyes fall on first, let that be God's decision for you because they all need somebody to pray for them, to write to them, and to sponsor them. And then don't go home with this without filling out this back portion. If you take this whole thing home and don't fill this out, this is the only place that kid exists. I mean, they exist in Ecuador, but I mean, this is the only place where we have record of them. And it'd be a tragedy if you take this home to think about it and forget, because then we don't have record of them. So if God's moving in your heart today, or throughout the next couple of weeks, we encourage you, would you make room in your life and your family and your heart for one more? It will make a huge impact on the children, but I guarantee you it will make an impact in your life as well. What a great opportunity we have. Sometimes you look at the poverty of the world and you think, what, what could I do? What difference could I make? Well, you can if you make room for one more. In Jesus' name, to release a child from poverty, let them know someone somewhere loves them. Let's pray. God, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you that you have made room for one more in each of our lives. You are always making room for one more by your grace. And for many of us, it's easier to write a check one time than it is to have an ongoing sponsorship but, or build a relationship across continents and countries. God, I pray that you'd move in our hearts, that we would see these children the way you see them, as precious and in need of love and support. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the way that you've blessed us, that we might be a blessing to others. We pray this in your name. Amen. It's, I get the privilege to introduce someone to you. He doesn't need an introduction. It's Pastor Tom. He's our high school pastor. I was a high school pastor here many years ago, and, and, and I just, I'm just i so grateful for our staff, for the talent, for the giftedness of our staff, and uh, for their, I think about the opportunities they have to bless us. And so welcome Tom Ward as he comes to preach the word to us. Our high school ministry uh, actually sponsors a compassion kid. His name is Gabriel. So been able to experience that firsthand as well. And it's just such an awesome opportunity. Thanks, Jeff, for sharing that with us. I want to remind you before we get started uh, this morning that if you did not receive your communion elements as you walked in, you can just raise your hands. Our usher team is in the back and they will come and find you. But it looks like most of us kind of know the drill at this point. Well, as we get started, I, I want uh, to ask you a question. Have you ever kind of done something in a moment without really thinking that was just like completely out of character for you? I remember this one time, I was I think in fourth grade or so and I played on a park district basketball team. And I'll be honest, I wasn't really the greatest basketball player. I didn't really hit my growth spurt until probably my freshman year in high school or so. But I, but I tried really hard, I played hard. I could make the occasional open shot or two and I was kind of too scared, too shy, too nervous to ever foul anybody. So I just never committed a foul. It was kind of like my thing that I was known for. But during this one game, something kind of got into me. I don't exactly remember what happened, but I think I had the ball and I brought it across half court and I either made a bad pass or I had the ball stolen from me and a player on the other team got the ball and just took off on a fast break, like a clear breakaway for a wide open layup and I kind of got mad. And so I chased him down and right when he began to kind of extend for his layup, I caught up to him and I pushed him as hard as I could square in the back and he went crashing into the side and into the wall, kind of the padding on the wall and he hit the deck and the gym went quiet. And the officials all huddled up. I don't think they knew quite what to do. A fourth grader just tried to kill somebody. And they decided to give me a flagrant foul, which apparently in elementary park district basketball means that I was ejected from the rest of the game. And I was in shock, right? Like, of course, I was angry and upset. I was pretty embarrassed by the whole thing. But I think more than anything, I was in shock that I did something like that. Something that if you had asked me like a million times before the game, I would have told you I never could have imagined doing something quite like that. And the kids still made the layup, so it probably wasn't really even worth it. 
Well, as we continue on in our series on the Gospel of Mark here this morning, titled Following the King, we're going to look at a pretty uncharacteristic moment that is played out. If you were with us last week, Pastor Brian was here and preached on Jesus in the Garden, which takes place kind of in the middle of Mark 14. And our story today we're going to look at is Peter's denial of Jesus, which ha- happens at the very end of the chapter. So before we get there, though, I think it's important to, to kind of take a minute or two to focus on the things that happened between the garden and Peter's denial, because we're skipping over just a little bit before we get to our text here this morning. So let me just give you a little bit of context to kind of catch us all up to speed on what's happening in Mark 14. Mark tells us that immediately after they leave the garden, that Judas comes and betrays Jesus. Just like Jesus was expecting, he had just mentioned that at the end of the garden story. But uh, Judas comes, he leads a crowd over to come and capture Jesus. And, And actually, John's gospel tells us that it's Peter who draws out his sword in defense of Jesus, and he cuts off the ear of one of the high priest's servants. And Jesus, he sees this, and immediately he tells Peter to put his sword away. And then in verse 15, in Mark's gospel, chapter 14, Mark tells us this about the disciples. He said, they all left him and fled. So Jesus is captured and he's put on trial before Annas and the high priest Caiaphas as the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death. And all of this really sets up the scene for where we pick up in our story here today. So if you have Bibles with you, you can open up with me to Mark chapter 14. We'll pick up in verse 66 and read through the end of the chapter. It'll be up here on the screens as well. Here's what Mark writes at the end of 14. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Now I think in in some ways it it can kind of be easy for us or, or somewhat tempting for us kind of at this point of the story to just kind of want to skip ahead a few weeks to Easter and to all that that really means, but I really believe as I've been studying this text that, that this story, which, which I think can feel pretty difficult to us when we read it and begin to dive into it, that it really has a lot to teach us about who Jesus is, about who we are, and ultimately what it really means and what it looks like to follow the King. And so let's dive right in here this morning. The first thing that I think we see in this text is what I'm calling Peter's Isolation. Peter's isolation. Some of you may know uh, that we have a young daughter at home. She's actually back in the nursery right now. Her name is Raylan. She likes to call herself Ray Ray. And I'm sure we all agree she's the cutest one out there, right? She's probably the best one. She loves those dolls more than anything. She's tons of fun. Uh, but like most toddlers, she loves to say, any guesses? No, she loves to say no. She just really likes things kind of working out her way. And she especially loves when she gets a few minutes to kind of sneak away for a little bit. Recently, within like a week of each other or so, me and my wife caught her two different times in our bathroom, kind of doing some silly things. The first time we saw her, she was standing outside of the empty bathtub, kind of trying to decide what to do. And she didn't know that we got to the door in time to watch this, but she ultimately decided to dive in head first into the empty bathtub, like on a rescue mission for some lost toy or something. She was okay, but it was pretty ridiculous. At another time, my wife caught her. Uh, She just got up to the door in time to see Ray with a whole wad of toilet paper that she had taken off for the roll. And she was standing there dipping it in the toilet bowl water. I'm not sure who left the seat open, uh, but it probably wasn't my wife. But uh, she was standing there just dipping the toilet uh, paper into the bowl and just like giggling and laughing and having the time of her life. See, I think sometimes when people are alone, right, when they're kind of isolated, they tend to do things a little bit differently than they might when they're in a group full of people. And we see this played out in a much more serious way in Peter's life. 
And I think at this point, it's actually really important for us to look back again, back into earlier in chapter 14, this time to a conversation between Jesus and the disciples following the Last Supper as they went to the Mount of Olives. So let's look back to what Mark writes in verse 27. He says, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. I think what we see happening here is a promise made in community. We've talked about this before, but this conversation, right, where Jesus predicts that Peter will deny him, it happened earlier in the same night, just hours before what we just read at the beginning. So it's kind of crazy, I think, if you, if you really pause to think about it. If you think about the fact that Peter really here is disagreeing with Jesus, and I don't know about you, but in my life, that oftentimes doesn't go super well. But let's think, let's think about Peter's life just for a moment, right? Peter, he's the guy, he's all in on following Jesus, right? He's, he's traded in his old life. He's given up his fishing nets. He is 100% committed to following Jesus no matter what happens. He is all in. And so I think in fairness to Peter, what Jesus is saying to him is, is really kind of crazy, like he just doesn't understand it. And, and really, I don't think there's any way he ever could have imagined that happening. So he really digs in his feet, right? He promises no matter what happens, I'll never fall away. And Mark tells us that all of the other disciples also said the same thing. But we know that after Jesus is arrested, the other disciples do fall away. And Mark includes another interesting detail in verses 53 and 54 says they led Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. We're gonna circle back and talk about this in a little bit more depth later on. But I think what we see happen here is that Peter made a, a promise in community. He says, I'll never fall away. But now, Peter, who's all alone, is still following Jesus, which I think he should get some credit for, but he's doing so at a distance. And it's here where we see a promise broken in isolation. Let's look back again at what Mark writes in verses 66 through 68. It says, and as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. John actually tells us that, that John himself was in the trial with Jesus, but all the other disciples, we believe at this point, have, have fled. They've all fallen away. And so Peter, who's now all alone, denied being with Jesus. He told the servant girl, I neither know nor understand what you mean. This is a really interesting tidbit because he's actually here using a very specific Jewish phrase to say that. You see, he chose his words very intentionally to make sure that he would kind of try to blend in with the crowd and not give up his true identity. And so why did Peter try so carefully to blend in? Why did he deny? Again, we'll, we'll talk about this more as we go, but I think at least one of the reasons is because he's isolated. He's broken off from the community of fellow believers. See, Peter was a, a faithful man who made a bold promise in the midst of community, but then broke that promise in the face of isolation because we weren't created to follow Jesus in isolation. Community matters. You see, following Jesus is an individual decision that each and every one of us need to make, but none of us are called to follow Jesus individually. 
We're called to follow Jesus together in community, right? Proverbs says iron sharpens iron. Because faith happens, growth happens, obedience happens when we follow Jesus in the midst of authentic community, where we share our struggles with one another, when we learn from each other's stories and perspectives, when we pray for one another, and even when we confront each other, when we, maybe we're not quite living the kind of life that we're called to live. Earlier this week, I had the opportunity for a few days to join our team that Anton mentioned earlier, 16 high school seniors and five adult leaders who are serving with one of our ministry partners in Cabo San Lucas. Here's our our group photo and our cool Cabo t-shirts, which Pastor Bruce especially loves. But uh, just an incredible week and a great team of students. We actually have a dinner tonight with with them and their families just to celebrate all that God did in and through our team this last week. But for me, I just got to visit for a few days. and, And the thing that really encouraged me the most for my time with this team was, was really just watching how this group of seniors live in authentic community. And we spent the, the whole week serving and working hard, but also just really reflecting on what God has done up until this point in their life, especially uh, in their high school career, these last four years as they're preparing to graduate and go on to what's, to what's next. And it was so cool watching them. Each night we took turns having them just kind of share with extreme vulnerability uh, about the things that they're anxious about, that they're nervous about as they go on to the next stage of, of life. And really this group of students in community really committed that when they, when they go off to whatever's next, across the country, to college, to wherever they go, they committed that they wanna to stay together, that they wanna seek Christian community wherever they go, and they're gonna try as hard as they can to follow Jesus closely into college and, and to beyond throughout their entire life. Let me just pause and say for a second, I believe that the future of the church has remarkable hope because of young people like that that you just saw up there on the screen because we aren't designed to follow Jesus alone, right? That's why we talk so much here at Chapel Street about group life, whether it's student ministry or men's ministry, women's ministry, care groups, there's all kinds of things offered. If you've been around here for any length of time, you've probably heard us talk about Rooted, something that we believe is a great on-ramp into community life because we believe that community is critical to faith. But here again in the courtyard, we see that Peter is all alone. And in isolation, he denies being with Jesus. And at the end of verse 68, we're told that he went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed. See, after denying Jesus, Peter seeks to isolate himself even further by physically backing away from the courtyard, essentially kind of going out onto the porch. And the rooster crowed for the first time but it appears as though Peter is so far away. He's so alone that he doesn't even recognize it. This leads us to the second denial and what I'm calling Peter's separation. I wonder if you've ever kind of had an opportunity to, to share about Jesus or to make him known to somebody who you know doesn't have a relationship with Christ. But for whatever reason, when it came up, you kind of just tried to look for a way out of the conversation, right? Try to look for a way to kind of separate yourself and avoid the subject. I remember this when I was uh, about a senior, I think I was a senior in high school and I'd chosen, I was gonna go to a Christian college and I was going to degree, uh, pursue a degree in ministry. And I remember this one conversation with a group of high school friends that I had. I knew that they weren't Christians, at least at the time. And we were just talking about kind of, you know, generic next step stuff, kind of like we talked about with the st- Uh, students in Cabo, just where are you going to go? What are you going to study? Are you going to play sports or intramurals? Like what's your, what's your career path? What's your goal? Where do you want to live? Just kind of basic stuff like that. And then all of a sudden I should have seen this coming, but the conversation turned to me. And even though I had fully figured out where I was going to go and what I was hoping and planning to do, when they asked me those questions, I lied. I lied for for some reason and I told him, you know what, I'm not really quite sure what my next step is. I'm still kind of trying to decide between a few really good options. For whatever reason, when I was asked that question, that if I was honest, would have made it really clear where I stood with Jesus, I kind of found my way out of the conversation. And I think in Peter's second denial, we see him do a very similar thing. Verse 69. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, 
he denied it. Now, you might have noticed that the question asked of Peter this time is a bit more direct, isn't it? Not just, are you with Jesus, but are you one of them? How would you answer that question? If somebody at school or at work, on your team or on your kid's team, in your neighborhood, if somebody were to approach you and ask you, are you one of them? Meaning, are you a follower of Jesus? What would you say? My guess is that some of us here this morning or watching online maybe aren't quite sure. Maybe you're still new and and seeking, trying to figure out who this Jesus guy is and and what that means for your life. And let me just say, if that's where you're at, that's okay. And we're so glad that you're here and, and starting in a good place. Some of us might emphatically say yes with with no hesitation because we've been in that scenario time and time again in our lives. But I think that many of us, maybe even most of us, while we might really want to say yes, truthfully, we still kind of might want some more information, right? Maybe ask the question, what, what exactly is the scenario here? Who's asking the question? Why are they asking the question? Would me saying yes risk anything, like my friendships or my reputation, my job? See, here I think in Peter's life, we, we really see the danger of him following Jesus at a distance. He's close enough to see what's going on, right, as Jesus is upstairs being put on trial, but he's still far enough away to have some level of separation. And I think the truth is, that we have churches full of people today who are following Jesus at a distance. With one foot in, right, to have a little bit of God in my life, to be close enough in case things go really well, but still kind of with one foot out to, to keep myself away, to be far enough away to protect myself in case things were to get a little bit crazy or something. I think it's really something that in the midst of a culture that's so focused on either being 100% in on something or someone or 100% out, that so many of us, I think oftentimes myself included, if we're really honest, would say that it feels safer to follow Jesus from a distance, right? To kind of just land somewhere in the middle. But the truth is, that the safest place that you could possibly be is as close to Jesus as you could possibly get. Or you might think that you're safer at a distance because you feel some sense of control, but you're not in control. None of us are, right? Jesus is. That's why the safest place you can be is as close to Jesus as you can get. So how close are you to Jesus? How close are you? You know, we've lived in this world for the past two years or so that's so focused on being distant. I was in the airport earlier this week flying home from Cabo, and I still notice those stickers on the floor that kind of advise you of how far to stay away from the person in front of you. Of course, we've, we've done all that stuff for, for good reasons and, and safe reasons and things like that. But how true has that been in your faith as well? Are you more comfortable following Jesus from a distance? Are you readily willing to kind of separate yourself in order to to keep safe or to make sure that this person doesn't view me in a certain way? Honestly, it's been a question that's kind of been bouncing around in my heart all week long. Do I really wanna be as close to Jesus as I can possibly get? Or is it better to kind of keep my distance, you know, just, just in case? I think we see this happen in Peter's life as he drifts further from Jesus. And this leads us to Peter's third denial, what I'm calling Peter's desperation. We'll take the rest of the story here verse by verse. First, let's look at verse 70. It says, after a little while, while the bystanders, while the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. Now, most scholars tend to agree that Peter stands out here because of his Galilean accent, an an accent from the north that really would have stood out in this region. And it especially would have stood out in the high priest's palace because likely many of them, even the servants of the high priest, would have had some level of prejudice against the Galileans. They would have thought that they're just kind of a group of people that's up to no good, just a bunch of troublemakers. So I think it's here where Peter's kind of beginning to feel the pressure 
He's beginning to, to be afraid that he's gonna be found out by the crowd that's in the courtyard. And this causes Peter really to do something drastic. And we see that in verse 71. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. Let's unpack that for a quick moment. See, what Mark is saying is, here is, is far more than just Peter used profanity, right? He didn't just use a bad word. But some scholars actually believe that our English translation isn't even the most accurate understanding of the Greek, that, that Peter didn't actually curse himself, but that he still did curse something or someone. And so what or who did Peter curse? He cursed Jesus himself. He cursed Jesus to further prove to the people in the crowd that he was not a disciple because no disciple would ever turn their back and curse their very own master. And so Peter goes to extreme lengths here, I think in a way that we can't really even understand in our culture in order to save his own skin. And this makes the public betrayal and the rejection of Jesus even more personal. So what happened in this moment? Why, why did Peter deny knowing Jesus? I think it's important to, to really point out that failure like this, whether it's in Peter's life or in our lives, it usually doesn't happen just in a single moment, right? It's a, it's a progression that happens slowly over time as we drift away further and further from Jesus. Psalm 1 talks about how when you, when you walk in sin, right, when you're kind of surrounded by it, then you're more easily tempted to stand in sin. And when you stand in sin, you're more easily tempted to sit in sin. I'm sure we've all experienced that in one way or another. You just kind of get comfortable. And without realizing it, you don't even notice how far you've drifted away. I think that's what's happened for Peter. Right? He didn't wake up one day and decide, I'm just gonna stop following Jesus. In fact, he actually did quite the opposite, right? Just hours earlier, he said, no matter what happens, I'll never fall away. But yet, in the face of extreme circumstances, as chaos ensued, as, as confusion surrounded him, as fear began to creep into his heart and mind, as Peter watches Jesus in, in, uh, before the council declaring that he is the son of man, Peter did something that he never could have imagined. He denied being with Jesus. He denied knowing Christ. And then we see in verse 72, immediately the rooster crowed a second time. Luke's gospel tells us that this is the moment where Jesus and Peter make eye contact. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Peter remembers what Jesus said earlier. He begins to recognize what he's done and he's in despair. Has that ever happened to you, where there's this thing that you've promised to yourself, you've promised before God you'd never do again. And then you go and do that very same thing. You feel a deep level of, of, of shame and, and guilt and regret. And actually the Greek phrase that describes Peter's reaction literally means falling, crashing, or laying down. See, this is far more than Peter just kind of feeling sorry for himself. Or, you know, just kind of kicking himself for, you know, slipping up again on that thing. See, Peter recognizes that within just a handful of hours, that his whole identity as a committed, faithful follower of Jesus has vanished. And he literally collapses onto the ground in despair and agony, wailing and sobbing over the worst moment of his entire life, denying the king. And Mark has quite the way with brevity. And so he ends the story here. But we know from uh, Peter's life and from his faith that, that his, his life and faith goes beyond just this moment. And so briefly, as we wrap up, let's take a look at Peter's restoration. The key to Peter's story really is understanding why Jesus allowed him to fail so miserably. 
And Luke includes a detail uh, that Mark doesn't in his account of Jesus predicting the denial. Here's what Luke says in chapter 22. He says, Simon, Simon, which is Peter's original name. Behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. That phrase turned again here literally means once you have failed and turned back. Jesus knew that Peter would fail, but he also knew that Peter's worst moment of his entire life would ultimately end up being the key moment of his life. Because after the resurrection, Jesus has this conversation with Peter, who at this point had gone back to his old life of fishing. And Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus reclaims him and restores him and tells Peter to follow me. See, previously, Peter's identity was all wrapped up in his ability to keep a promise. It's all based on his commitment that he will never fall away. I think it's here as Jesus is asking these questions, do you love me? Where Peter recognizes his true identity. You see, being committed to Jesus is a great thing. I think we should all long to be more committed to Jesus than we are right now. But ultimately, your identity is not based on your commitment because you'll fall short. You'll fail. We all have, and we all will. That's why the hope of the gospel is that your identity is based on what Jesus has done for you. Jesus going through the agony of the garden. Jesus experiencing the suffering of the cross so that, as Peter writes later on, you can experience new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Have you ever thought about why this story is included in the Bible? If Peter was all alone in the courtyard, then how did Mark know to include it in the gospel? I think it must be because Peter told him, right? That Peter shared the worst moment of his entire life for Mark to record and for us some 2,000 years later to study and read as we really dive in and look at what it means to follow Jesus. Is it there so we can be encouraged? At least I'm not as big of a mess up as Peter, Of course not, right? It's actually quite the opposite. It's here in God's word so that we might know despite our shortcomings, despite our failures, despite our fears and our temptations, despite the times where we misplace our identity, despite all of those things, that we might know the love, the forgiveness, the grace, and the restoration that is only found in Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for today, Lord, and the opportunity that we have to gather together and worship you in community. God, we thank you for this story, and despite the difficulty that we might feel and face as we read it, Lord, that that we we remember that our identity isn't rooted in in who we are and, and what we can do, but it's rooted in you in your death and resurrection. God, may you give us the strength today to follow you closely and the grace to meet us in the times in which we fail. We'll give you all the glory. Amen. You can take out the communion elements and and begin to, to peel off that top layer. As we come to the table together this morning. I just want to remind you that here at Chapel Street, we don't believe that this is our table, but it's, it's Christ's table, open to all who have personal relationship with him. And so as we continue to reflect on the power of this story, as we come, let's come to the table together to acknowledge our need and to remember his sacrifice for us. The gospels tell us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, that he, that he took bread and broke it. And he passed it to the disciples. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat.
And after they finished eating, Jesus poured out a cup. And he said, this is the cup, this cup is, is the new covenant of my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. That every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, that we proclaim the truth and the grace of Jesus until he comes again. Let's proclaim this together by drinking the cup. Amen. So I remind you as we close that our prayer team will be available in the glass room out in the lobby and also the compassion tables are all set up over there and we'd love for you to, to stop by and prayerfully consider partnering with us this Easter season. Receive now this morning's benediction. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who sees you in your struggles, who restores you to your true identity and, to get in, and who gives you a living hope through his resurrection. Amen.